um, if you'll um, ask your questions in the chat instead of um, through the microphone, that would be great. Um, we are going to record this meeting um, to use for our Hunters for the Hungry program. Um, so if you'll just ask your questions in the chat instead of through their microphone and make sure your microphone's off so we don't get any feedback, that would be awesome. Um, somehow you found us. It may have been through Facebook or through our website or somewhere else. Um, but if you're not following us on Facebook, that's a great way to stay up to date with everything we have going on. Um, and if you don't like Facebook, we do have an awesome website that one of our board members just updated and she did a spectacular job. So I encourage you to check that out. A lot of our information is housed on there, including like our past programs. Um, and just more information about everything that we do. So we are the Concord Wildlife Alliance and we will be having a give thanks for wildlife in November. So um, it's gonna be partially virtual and partially in person. We're gonna have um, a part of Cabarrus Brewing Company's Mission Monday. So that will be on Monday, November 16th from four to 10. It's kind of just a drop-in thing. Um, and a dollar from every pint sale, or if you want to stop in and get a four pack of beer, um, a dollar of every purchase will go towards our um, event, which is Give Thanks for Wildlife, and that will go to our Hunters for the Hungry program, which is what we're talking about this evening. So it would be awesome to see your faces in person and um, learn a little bit more about everything that the Wildlife Alliance does. So hope to see you there. Um, our speakers tonight are going to be Jeremy Udy. He's the owner of Rocky River Game Processing. Um, and then Chris Edscorn. He's the food program manager at Cooperative Christian Ministries. And then Alicia McDaniel, the program manager at Cabarrus Health Alliance. So each one of them play a big part in feeding Cabarrus County. And um, I'm excited to hear more about what they do from them themselves. So we'll jump into that. So did Jeremy join us? I can't, I can't see it because I just stopped sharing my screen. Hey, this is Jeremy. I'm sorry. I can't get the Google Meet to come up. Uh, but I am, however, on the phone. Awesome. Well, um, if you just want to talk a little bit about what you do and um, anything you want to talk about, we're excited to learn more about your end of our. Sure, sure. One of the uh, one of the issues uh, some of the hunters have in the area is they obviously have a uh, number of deer they can kill every year, and they don't need all those deer. So, you know what this program helps does do for them is it helps them to still fill their tags and that way it doesn't waste any of their efforts it can it can be donated and go obviously to chris and those guys and, and can be given to people that need it so it's really helped out in the hunting community because it gives it creates an avenue for people to still enjoy what they do yet however people it, it gets to people that need it Awesome. Um, one of one of the big questions that we always get is how much venison do you get from one deer and how long does it take you to process those deer? Okay, the answer to the first question obviously depends on the size. The average, I would say, would be around 25 to 30 pounds of actual product. The answer to the second question would be that once the harvest has been made, it's been brought here and it actually cures for a seven day period. Then after that seven day period, it is butchered uh, into whatever uh, is to be made in. And that process takes about an hour per deer. So it's, it's over a eight, seven to eight day period, but the actual butchering process takes about an hour. Awesome. Um, that's great to know. I feel like a lot of people 
are not um, sure about, you know, the back end process of that. So that, thank you for sharing that. Sure. Um, I, one thing that the Wildlife Alliance helped Jeremy do last year um, for Rocky River Processing was to um, be certified through the state. If you would like to talk a little bit about what that means, um, that would be great. Can you say that one more time? I apologize. I didn't hear the entire question. No worries. Um, so we worked with you a lot on getting certified through the state for processing. Correct. Um, and that was, that's something that we do get a lot of questions about um, from people who aren't familiar with the process. So if you could just talk about like, what does being certified by the state actually mean? Sure. We are governed, that, that inspection and process is governed by the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. And you guys helped us get certified, which means we go through biannual inspections. And it's for um, obviously, obviously cleanliness. Um, it involves uh, a strenuous uh, line or amount of um, things they check. And, and it's, it's a really good thing because it just helps ensure the end product is, is what it needs to be for individuals that, that eat it. And we have to we have to post that uh, certification every year, so it's it's hanging in our lobby at the time. Um, and like I said, they 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 go through a rigorous checklist, and uh, you know before they will allow us to do anything to process any meat that goes out of here for you guys, it has to be inspected. Awesome. Thank you. Um, one question that just popped up in the chat was, is there a cost to donate a deer harvest? Um, if you want to talk about that, go right ahead. Sure. I have some uh, pamphlets and cards that Glenn, Miss Glenda Steele had brought by or, and Jack had, had brought by and left. It does not cost anything for that individual to leave the deer. However, we do ask when they fill out the paperwork, we hand those them a brochure and a card and ask that they make a donation to Conquer Wildlife Alliance. So, Thank hopefully you. that'll answer that question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, another question is how much does um, the how much are you charging for the deer for our program? Um, so, if somebody wanted to donate one deer processing, how much would that be? Uh, last year, I think what we did, we kind of worked out a agreed upon price and then uh, Glenda could probably tell you better than I could. I think we just kind of worked it out to what money was raised uh, and then kind of did a certain amount of deer. I'm not sure exactly what that dollar amount came out to per deer. Thank you. Um, Glenda, do you want to chime in here? Maybe not. Okay. Well, those are all of our questions. Um, I'm sorry that you were having technical difficulties, Jeremy, but thank you so much for talking about the processing side of our um, project. Thank you. Sure. And if anyone has any questions after after we're done, feel free to contact us or come by. And we're, you know, we're extremely glad to be a part of this. Chris and and his and the program he's with, they've been great. You know, they come and pick up weekly. And uh, you know, I'm I'm glad that, that we as a company get to be a part of that and give back to the community. Thank you. Um, Glenda just put it in the chat that we were doing $60 for each deer. But like Jeremy said, um, there's no cost to, to dropping a deer off. But um, if you want to make a donation, you're more than welcome to do that with Jeremy or through the law. Sure. Um, so if we would like to, we'll jump to 
Chris and let him talk about um, CCM, who we donate our deer to. All righty. Um, thank you so much, Serena, and, and um, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, it's been great working with you so far in the last year. I'm looking forward to it again this year. Uh, I am Chris. Ed Scorn. I've been program, uh, food program manager at CCM now for uh, about a year and a half. I've uh, been on staff there about five years, and, and um, uh, it's been a wonderful organization to work for. Uh, and uh, uh, we've been very blessed by uh, partners in the community like y'all who, who make it possible for us to, to feed a lot of people. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, in uh, 2019 and 20, uh, last uh, about, I guess, uh, November through January, y'all donated 1,968 pounds of venison to CCM. Um, almost a ton. And since we give a package of deer meat to each household, uh, that's about 2,000 households who receive venison uh, from CCM through y'all and because of y'all. Um, now, we do have clients who turn their noses down sometimes to deer meat. We don't force it on, any, on anybody. But there are many others who get quite excited about it. And I remember last year, one time I was walking into the, uh, the building as a gentleman was pushing his cart full of food out and he was literally dancing and singing, I've got deer meat, I've got deer meat. <laughs> so um, it's certainly something that's very, very uh, uh, loved by, by some folks. There was another lady one time who, um, when we offered her the venison, she started crying. And she said that she grew up on venison, that her, her father was a big farmer, was a big hunter, and she loved it. But when he passed away a number of years ago, she ne had never had any more. Uh, until we gave it to her. And she was really looking forward to, to enjoying that, enjoying the memories that would be associated with it. So thank you all so much for, for making this program possible and for blessing so many families. Um, and of course, not only is venison popular with many of our clients, but as you know, it's also quite nutritious. It's uh, much leaner than most other red meats. Uh, briefly, I just wanna talk a little bit about CCM and, and who we are and what we do. Um, you know, when people hear about CCM, some people think about our, our food program uh, and the food pantries. And for others, it's our family housing um, program. And both of those are very important components of who we are. But there's one more, uh, financial assistance. Uh, and that's become a very important aspect, uh, especially during this COVID um, um, pandemic. Our mission is to provide immediate assistance to members of our community who are experiencing crisis in the areas of food, shelter, and finances, while engaging them in a series of actions that will empower them to move beyond that crisis. And so our vision is that every person in our community discovers their purpose and, ex and experience of fulfillment that God intends for their lives. We seek to, to meet people at their point of crisis, uh, whether it be food, uh, insecure, food insecurity or financial or housing, and provide immediate relief but then we also desire to build in some accountability. And this comes more in our housing program and financial assistance programs and in the food area, which moves them towards sustainability and finally to restoration. Through this whole process, we're building relationships with our clients and providing them with a host of great programs and services. Uh, this process is best seen in our family housing program where we've developed a, a path to stability. Most of the families who stick with this roughly three-year program will end up in very stable housing or even owning their own homes. We're also developing a series of training programs, helping our clients to address their financial crises, to develop a plan for a sustainable financial future, and for understanding the unwritten rules for getting ahead in today's world. Uh, as I mentioned, our financial assistance program has uh, really stepped up uh, in, in recent uh, months. Uh, during this, pa uh, this pandemic, we've been entrusted with significant funds and responsibility by our, our community. Um, both the cities of Concord and Kannapolis and Cabarrus County have all uh, contributed uh, a, a large part of their, their federal funds that they've received. And since March, we've distributed more than than $500,000, uh, half a million dollars, to help about 450 families to avoid eviction and or utility cutoff. Uh, we also have our housing program that I've talked about already. That's our, my, my father's house, the mother and children's home, and our teaching house program. 
And uh, between those different programs, we're able to, uh, to house about, um, about 40 families during the year, representing about uh, almost 100 people and including uh, uh, about 47 children. So that's the financial assistance and housing. Let's talk about food. Now, that's, what, uh, that's, where, that's where the venison all comes in, uh, into play. Uh, in 2019 and 20, uh, our, our fiscal year that ended in June, CCM served food to an average of 1,200 households a month, representing about 3,800 individuals. Um, we served uh, those, those folks uh, uh, over the course of the year more than a million pounds of food. Uh, which averaged out to about 71 pounds per family per visit. To help visualize that, it would take about 13 full 18-wheeler tractor trailers to haul 1 million pounds of food. Um, CCM has uh, our main food pantry at, the, at uh, our crisis center on, on Concord Lake Drive, on, on Country Club Drive, I'm sorry. Um, we also operate seven satellite pantries scattered around the county four in Kannapolis, uh, uh, two others in, in Concord, and one in Midland. Uh, and since the middle of March, um, um, one of those had to close down. Uh, they were all senior citizens and just aren't able to, to serve right now. But the others of us uh, are, for the most part, are operating drive-through or drive-up food pantries uh, with uh, pre-boxed or, or pre-bagged food for the clients that's loaded into their cars and, and off they go. Uh, early in the crisis, we saw a huge jump in our in the number of clients served, but that certainly has leveled off as there's in, in more recent months as there's a lot more finances available um, and also uh, other food cramp, uh, food programs available. Um, in addition to our food pantries, we also operate a, a backpack program. We provide 62 bags of food uh, to students at Carver and, and, and Winecoff Elementary Schools uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, we conduct mobile food pantries in, uh, from April through October. Our last one this year is going to be next week. Uh, those are usually held at various churches or around the uh, uh, Kannapolis and Concord area, and we'll serve between 125 and 175 uh, households um, uh, in, in one morning uh, through those mobile food pantries. And something we've, we started just uh, during this uh, COVID crisis, our food desert drops. Uh, we were blessed with a lot of extra USDA food. And uh, we were able to take some of that into uh, low-income communities, such as the Carver community, um, Gibson Village uh, in, in Concord, or um, um, the little Texas area uh, in, in Kannapolis, and distribute that to, uh, to families that already had pre-registered. Um, and also, we share some of our extra uh, food, uh, reclaimed food, especially with other community uh, food pantries and partners. Where does all this food come from, besides from the hunters? Um, about 41% of the, uh, the food we receive comes from the USDA uh, through their Emergency Food Assistance Program, or TFAP uh, program. And that's, uh, that's the old peanut butter and cheese program that some of our older folks may remember. Uh, it's a lot more to, uh, to that now, and a lot of um, non-perishables, as well as a lot of frozen and um, uh, fresh food and fresh, fresh dairy and fresh produce. Uh, we receive about 24% of our food from... Uh, that's reclaimed from stores and restaurants, uh, fresh produce, bakery foods, uh, deli foods, and frozen meats that come from grocery stores and, and, and restaurants. About 8% of our food comes from Second Harvest Food Bank down in, in um, uh, Charlotte. Uh, about 11% comes from church food drives. Uh, you know, churches were, are, the, uh, are our foundation and uh, certainly are, are certainly great partners still. And then about 16% comes from other uh, 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 big food drives, businesses, individuals, schools, farms, and hunters. Um, so that's uh, an idea of where we get the food from. And who does it go to? Who are our clients? Uh, we serve um, about 57% of the, of the families we serve have children in the household. In fact, the average household size is about 34 um, we also serve uh, about a quarter of the families we serve uh, have seniors, senior citizens in the, in the homes. Uh, many of those are in very low fixed income and um, often have very, very little uh, food stamps. Uh, about 75% of the total households that we serve uh, have either children and or um, senior citizens. And it's not unusual for our clients to leave in tears as they uh, as they, uh, as, as they um, leave our pantry, 
uh, because of the love and respect they receive as well as the amount of food they, they uh, receive. Many of our volunteers take the time to get to know the clients and it's not unusual to see them praying together at the end of their, their time uh, at the pantry. Now, things have changed a lot with the, with, uh, the, the pandemic and with uh, the drive through pantry. We don't have as much contact with our clients. We're just talking to them through their car doors. But even then, it gives us a chance to chat with them sometimes and even to pray with them. Um, uh, it's been a blessing uh, and, and, and a great responsibility to be able to serve, especially during this time, during this crisis. And uh, we're so grateful for, for community partners, including y'all, uh, who have made it possible to give a lot of food, a lot of good, fresh food. And, and local food uh, to our clients. And um, so uh, thank you all so much. Thank you for, for all that you do to make this possible, whether it's contributing funds to, to help um, uh, uh, process that deer or whether it's actually contributing the deer itself, themselves, uh, we are, we're grateful. And that's what I've got so far. Uh, any, any questions? Thank you, Chris. Um, there's one, one question in the chat. Um, from Michael, and it's, are there communities of color associated with CCM? Um, I'm not sure if he means the food program or just in general, um, but I think you kind of touched on that a little bit, but. Yeah, we serve, uh, you know, anybody who, who, um, uh, who comes, uh, no matter, you know, race or, or anything. We can't, we, we're not allowed by the, by the, because we receive federal money, we're not allowed to, dis to discriminate against anybody, but we certainly wouldn't anyway. Uh, that's not who we are as Christians. Um, and we have a number of people of color who, who volunteer uh, with us uh, among our volunteers. And, um, uh, um, and certainly, um, you know, we, we uh, probably target uh, communities of color um, with our food desert drops and our, our, and our mobile food pantries. Yeah. Um, Tara asked, um, how have the clients taken to the venison? And then are there any interesting recipes that clients have shared after? Uh, you know, again, we don't force on anybody. We just offer it to them and some are very grateful and, and love it. And some, eh, not so much, you know, they don't, they, don't, they think about Bambi and they don't want to you know, have anything to do with, with yeah. uh, eating Bambi. Yeah. But um, uh, certainly uh, uh, they talk about using it in chili, in spaghetti sauce, because um, it's, it's all ground. All that we get from, from uh, Rocky River is in, in ground form, that's fine. Um, um, but uh, chili, tomato, uh, spaghetti sauce, um, you know, soups, uh, things like that, that sort of cover that, that gave me flavor. Yeah, that's a good way to eat it. I'll, hamburgers are one of my favorites. Okay. Um, um, a question from Glenda was um, some, some chapters of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation have created venison chili kits with a recipe and then the ingredients. Oh, okay. Them. And then you kind of just include the venison. Um, would that be helpful, or would just kind of compiling venison recipes be helpful? Could we do something like that, maybe? Uh, probably just uh, maybe recipes. Um, it you know we we um, don't always have any one ingredient that we might need. You know, like you know we may not have a whole lot of diced tomatoes for the chili or, or something like that. You know. Um, Right now we do, but we never know what we're going to have between November and, and January. So probably more just recipes, uh, maybe a variety of recipes that they could use, uh, depending on what they receive, what else they receive from the pantry. Awesome. Um, and I think the other questions that I had have kind of been answered. Okay. Um, but if there's if anybody has any more, feel free to drop them in the chat, and we can circle back at the end um, if any more questions come up. So thank you, Chris. Oh, you're welcome. All right, Alicia, are you ready? Yes, I am. I'll go ahead and transition yeah. to my slides. How are you guys doing? Hopefully well. Okay. Can you see the PowerPoint presentation? Yep. I Fantastic. So my name is Alicia McDaniel, um, and I'm so thankful to be with you all this evening. Um, part of my work is to look at food access, um, nutrition, and education at the Cabarrus Health Alliance. If you aren't aware, we are the health department, um, but we are considered a public health authority since we are separate from the county, though we are great friends. We work together on lots of different initiatives, particularly in the realm of COVID at this particular time. Um, but we do have our own Board of Health, so we're able to move and adjust to the needs of the community. 
And so we're just going to go through a few basic um, just instructionals around food access real quick. So the first thing is, according to 2019 county health rankings, Cabarrus County was ranked as a 7.9 in regards to the food environment index. Now that is higher um, than the North Carolina as a state was ranked. So we are far from perfect, but um, we are definitely doing better than others in the state. So that's something to be thankful for. Um, and there are two different components that food environment is calculated. So they utilize uh, the limited access to healthy foods as well as food insecurity. So those are the two factors there. Um, in 2017, there was an estimate of almost 24,000 individuals who, who were considered to be food insecure in Cabarrus County. And that equates to about 12% of our population. Now this particular map kind of just provides a visual of the areas that are really um, experiencing the most um, impact in regards to food access. So the green spaces that you see are considered food deserts. And if you count them, there should be around seven. One is actually right on that barrier of um, Rowan and Cabarrus. But these areas are basically locations that have limited access to healthy food, um, a vendor of healthy food in regards to like a grocery store, or even a convenience store um, that serves a variety of different options. But that is within a one mile radius within an urban setting. And if we were in a rural setting, it would have been 10 miles. Now, I don't know about you, carrying my groceries for one mile to the grocery store and back seems quite a task. It would limit you in regards to what you could purchase. So what they've also done in the orange spaces is look at what are the areas that have limited access within half mile radius? Probably more realistic for someone to walk back and forth. And so those are their owner spaces. Um, go ahead and look at this um, imprint it in your mind because we'll be able to look at where are the SNAP and ABT locations located? Are they near um, these areas or are they far away? Now, food deserts. Um, so food deserts, um, I provided a definition, but basically they're areas that have um, limited access to healthy food. And it can also be in regards to just having low vehicle access. There was no transportation is a barrier. Now, Cabarrus County is one of 18 counties in North Carolina that has six or more census tracts that have classified food deserts. So um, we are one of the um, more populated areas that do actually have food, at, uh, food deserts. One of the um, big statistics that I like to look at um, is not just how many people um, do not have access to consistent healthy food, but are there any differences on the types of people? So even though there's 25,000 residents that live within that food desert area, 39% of these residents are considered African-American or Hispanic. Now, considering the breakdown of our population, we see that there is definitely a disparity there, um, whereas more African-American Hispanics by a percentage are impacted by food deserts than their white counterparts. Now, according to the 2016 Cabarrus County Community Needs Assessment. Now, this needs assessment is conducted every four years, and we are um, in the process of, when I say we, I really mean Marcella Beam. Um, she is the Chief of Community Health, and she is organizing the finalization of this report. So they have already done the selection of our priority needs, but we'll be revealing that um, in the next coming months. So we'll have a new report to, to look at, but in 2016, um, 15% of the respondents said they had lack of access to, to healthy foods. Whereas you can see the statistic I shared before was 12%. So it's somewhere in between that 12 and 15%. Now, what are some alternative food access pieces? Um, I'm so glad that Ed is on this call because the work that he and his team do is phenomenal um, in order to address the needs of just getting food on the table and then also just really pushing the, the need for healthy food. Um, so we know food pantries are key in this effort. Um, farmers markets, uh, listing uh, lunch plus programs that individuals can participate in, community gardens, summer mobile feeding processes and sites. Um, this number probably has increased. This is a number that we were able to collect back in April, but given COVID-19 and how schools are operating, I'm sure that number has increased quite a bit. Um, and then I would be remiss if I didn't mention Meals on Wheels, backpack programs, and even the Boys and Girls Club summer feeding program. So in the world of food access, there are lots of different people in Cabarrus County trying to make sure people have access to healthy food throughout the year. And so I'm proud to be a part um, of the team. 
Now for this presentation, I'll go into SNAP and EBT and um, it was once referred to as food stamps. We now ref refer to it as SNAP and EBT, which stands for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And this is a federal program and the Department of Health and Human Services is the facilitator of such. And um, if you look here, you can see on that graph, all of the SNAP retailers. Now, um, it should overlay, and most of them do actually overlay with our, our, our food deserts. And so that's a good thing. We want these SNAP and EBT facilities to be where people really need access to, particularly with uh, establishments like corner stores that may um, be within walking distance. They may have some access to healthy food um, that they otherwise may not have access to if they had to go outside of the community or arrange bus transportation, et cetera. Um, but this is just a scale just so you know that people who are receiving these funds are at or below 130% of the poverty line. And you can see that that amount changes based on the amount of people that are within the household. This is a utilization chart starting back from 2000 to 2018. Um, I think with the pandemic, we'll see a surge in utilization, particularly since um, a lot of uh, SNAP redemption can actually be done online. And that was not the case prior to. So um, I'm interested to see what the statistics say. But in 2019, about 9% of our Cabarrus County residents were receiving SNAP benefits. Um, once again, looking at if 12 to 15% of people that we know based on surveys and collection of information are food insecure, we're still missing a good percentage of people um, that are just aren't receiving these benefits. Now, WIC is another um, great program. Um, and the, as the Cabarrus Health Alliance, we actually house this program um, and it's available to pregnant, breastfeeding and postpartum women, infants and children up to the age so you do have to be a North Carolina resident. Um, your income level will be um, at or below 185% of the poverty line. And it does provide um, nutritional support for both the mother and the child. Now, um, currently we have about 6,500 individuals that are eligible for this program. And there are 39 vendors. So, um, and that could be pharmacies, grocery stores, or even um, corner stores even. Um, you do see that there's an influx of utilization. So um, the highest number we see here is dating back to October 2019, where only 3,100 individuals were receiving these benefits. Going back to the amount of people who are eligible, it's closer to 6,500. So um, trying to make sure that people understand what are the benefits out there available to them and getting them um, tapped into our programming so that way they can fully benefit from the resource. This is another um, opportunity where we may see, and I anticipate we will see an increase in utilization given the pandemic, as well as um, the transition of how you're able to redeem your, your benefits and doing most of that online or over the phone. So I think we've removed some barriers in having to respond to the pandemic that in essence has been really great for our, our community. Now, I love this. Um, so some of you know, particularly if you're in the Farm and Food Council with me, um, that I worked on the REACH grant, which was uh, a grant called Racial and Ethic Approaches to Community Health. And we really worked in the food of, in the realm of food access with corner stores and community gardens and school gardens. Um, we also worked with the food pantries. Um, but I do really believe um, in the power and access that really provide as a primary food source. So for many people living in food deserts, that is their primary food source avenue. And so by encouraging these store owners to provide healthier foods um, on a regular basis in bigger quantities, we really can change the dynamic of what our communities look like. And through the um, Cabarrus County Corner Store Network that we were able to develop starting in 2014, these stores were set up so that way they continue on beyond the grant, which ended in 2018. Um, but there were st 12 stores in Cabarrus County that were in food deserts that agreed to increase their access to healthy food. Um, and one of the ones that I think is the easiest to spot if you're ever in downtown Concord and you um, see a beautiful mural of, you know, an orange in the sky and people enjoying broccoli, et cetera. Sitter City Max is one of the locations. Um, I'm extremely proud of them because when I first went to that store in 2014, um, they had a dream of being a tienda um, offering lots of fruits and vegetables, as well as um, having a having a meat market there. And now they actually do have that. So just in a small couple of years and the desire to make a difference in their community, um, we were able to support them in, in their dream of transitioning their store. 
So I'm really proud of the mural. Go by and take a walk by there. Um, and I think that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Alicia. That was so awesome. I loved, I am not plugged into those kind of stats. So that was really cool to hear about. Um, yeah, thank you. I do have one question from Marsha um, for you. And um, so she knows that you guys have a food box at Cabarrus Health Alliance. Um, is there a need for goods, specific types of goods to be put in there um, as something maybe the Concord Wildlife Alliance could help you guys with? Absolutely. Um, so anytime you guys can provide, we try to push healthier items, but the main thing is we want people fed. Um, but if you have any healthier items, so if you're going to provide canned goods, looking at no salt or low sodium options, we also are able to put things that have, you know, longer shelf life. So if they're mandarin oranges or bananas, something like that, we found as soon as we put them in the box, um, people are picking them up and it's been a great success. Um, that effort was not done by the Cabarrus Health Alliance. A Boy Scout group actually came to the Cabarrus Health Alliance with that idea. And so once again, if you have an idea that you believe is going to impact the community, we are set up to try to make it happen and sustain it for you. Um, but that's been a great effort. Uh, another piece I wanted to shout out for Ed and his team is the Community Free Clinic also has a food pharmacy. And so Ed and his team at the Cooperative Christian Ministry was really instrumental in helping us implement that for their patients. So patients that are seen at the Community Free Clinic have access to the food pharmacy at no cost, and they provide food on a weekly basis. And once again, we were able to use their expertise um, at CCM to figure out what works, what to offer, and then just ensuring that more and more people have access to healthy food every day so they can live better. Live better. Awesome. Thank you. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that, Chris? Or... <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, the, there's, there's the, the Health Alliance in our, in our community has done so much to, to increase in the amount of healthy foods available to, to, to clients. Um, and, and she's touched on a number of different programs, and there's, there's a lot more, too, I think. <laughs> but uh, uh, we are we we love our partnership with them and and, and being able to work with them. Awesome. And um, so I got this question from two different people. Marsha just put it in the chat, and then I had it from Karen as well. Um, for you, Alicia, does um, do you guys have recipes that could be you know given to CCM to go with the venison um, for preparing it? Um, I don't. Know currently but the great thing is we have an executive chef and so mark allison is phenomenal i have yet to taste anything that tastes less than heavenly for him so um i can definitely make that request and see if he has anything in mind um, a lot of our recipes are um you know tailored to be plant-based um, but i think that's definitely something we can ask him to, to look into for us thank you so much for the suggestion karen and marcia i miss y'all yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then one more question uh, from Glenda. It's in the chat. Has the community YMCA Share the Harvest Farm met its goals in reaching residents in the food deserts? And does it donate fresh food to CCM? It does donate fresh food to CCM occasionally. <laughs> and uh, a part of that, is it, I think, is dependent on volunteers and on, on the crop, on, on the, you know, how well the crops are, are doing. Uh, we got a lot of a lot of things from them early in the summer, and then I haven't seen too much lately. Um, I'm not sure what their goals are exactly, but uh, um, and I do know that they do send food to other agencies too, besides just CCM. Um, uh, another partner that uh, related to that uh, is the Lomax Farm, um, which used to be uh, county run and it's not anymore, but uh, used to be a teaching farm. Now it's a, a research farm. But they have partnered with this, and we're getting a lot of very wonderful fresh produce from them um, uh, this this summer. And now that in, now in the fall, the fall crops are starting to come in. Awesome. Um, well, those are all the questions that I have. Um, if anyone else has additional questions, drop them in the chat. Well, if not, 
this was awesome. Um, thank you guys so much for talking a little bit about what you do. And it's always cool to see how all the different pieces are connected um, within Cabarrus County. So I'm excited for our um, Hunters for the Hungry program to kick off. And yeah, looking forward to donating some venison. Thank you guys so much.